What's going on, everyone? Good evening, good evening, good evening. It is Wednesday night, and this is when I record my episodes um, called Financial Literacy Matters. So um, I have something that I decided to do pretty, li- pretty last minute. Um, I was trying to debate on what to focus on tonight, and I would really like to be in a space where I can really um, – have things prepared much earlier, but there's something that's been happening re- recently. Um, I feel like the universe is trying to tell me something and really shift me in a direction um, that's really grounded around the concept around this channel. This channel is called the Njoku School. Again, my name is Uche Njoku, uh, aka the Sneaker Principal, and the host of the Sneaker Principal podcast. Um, and the reason that I even named this channel Joku School because in my mind, I'm thinking about all the things that um, that I wished that school would have been for me. And as a principal now, those of you who know, I am a high school principal in New York City. So um, what I tend to do is a lot of things that I, that I do in my school is really framed around the things that I wished were done for me. Um, by no means am I radical, but I am practical in the sense of thinking what would have helped me be much more um, grounded and much more um, um, productive in the real world? And one of the biggest things for me is for the financial literacy. And financial re- literacy is something that I was not afforded in school. Um, my family um, being immigrants here and, and not having the benefit of real solid grounding in the American financial system struggled. And um, for the most of my childhood, we're in debt. Um, so... So that kind of like, it's like, you know, debt is like a, uh, it's like a, you know, people, where I, where I come from, we call it, we, we label things generational curses. The one thing is this, it goes from one generation to another generation, if it's not nipped at the butt. And what happened is, in my case, um, it wasn't nipped at the butt. So what ended up happening is my parents' financial um, illiteracy became my financial illiteracy until I finally found a way to fix it. So this evening, as you can see from the title, um, I'm going to be discussing a book that's become one of my uh, mainstay. And it's funny because I was looking for it on my shelf and I realized my two copies are actually in the school building. So, um, but that's okay though, because I can still talk about the book and, um, and, and not, you know, destroy it for those who want to read it. And it's a book that I've read actually several times. It's a book that is, I believe should be um, a text within schools in teaching students the foundation of um, financial literacy. Financial literacy has multiple steps and this is a great foundational step that I think anyone can understand regardless of what age you are. So um, what I'm going to do this evening, I'm going to go into it really briefly and pick out three things from the book. There's quite a few things, but I'm going to pick out three things from the book that that um, I think will speak to the average person, regardless of how old you are, where you're from, your financial situation. I think these are three th- uh, truths that you can definitely you know um, stand upon in building financial wealth and getting yourself in, on track if you're out of off track. So with that being said, um, let's go ahead and start this episode of Financial Literacy Matters. So if you're watching this evening, do me a favor. If at any point in time my audio goes out, just drop me a text as soon as possible. There's been something happening with the um, bandwidth um, lately that I've had a lot of audio drops a lot of times I don't catch it until I'm like four or five sentences in. So I, I want to minimize that. Um, however, if you're new to the channel, thank you so much. Um, you know, I, I know I always got to shout you out. Rhea Eats World, you know, my, uh, my executive producer and wife who's always watching um, and making sure that I'm, <clears throat> I am on track here. Uh, but if it's your first time watching and you're, you're and to this channel, um, definitely make sure um, to subscribe um, like share and also drop me a message. Let me know how this this goes for you and make and let me know what I can do to do this to make this better for you. Um, I tend to have more of a teaching style because I am a an educator. My like I've said before, my role is is school principal, but I am a teacher, so uh, I tend to try to make sure that uh, whatever I say, there is um, there is a finished product that you can walk away with and apply as soon as possible. So um, 
with that being said, let's jump into this. So um, I have to give you a foundational um, uh, 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 a backdrop for why we're talking about um, this book called The Richest Man in Babylon. So today I had an assembly with my 12th graders. And, um, and I, I do this thing that a lot of people would say is super risky. I ask my students to speak freely. Tell me what you're, what's going on with you. Tell me what's happened. Tell me what you're satisfied with, what you're not satisfied with. Speak to me. And, um, and my students, you know, they took on the challenge as they always do. And um, this, dude, this is something, there was something that was said that definitely caught my attention. Something that made me think like, you know what? I need to really jump on the ball with this. The question is when and how. But sometimes, you know, when we hear like great ideas and the universe is trying to tell us something, sometimes we just got to jump on it. And it's something I'm, I'm definitely jumping on um, sooner than later. But uh, I wanted to make sure to, to kind of start the ball rolling in this space because this channel doesn't only speak to teachers, doesn't only speak to spar- parents. I'm hoping that that teachers and parents will drag their kids or even their the young adults will, uh, young uh, and um, and adolescents will find this content and say, "Hey, this is interesting. I need to learn this." So, um, a student this, um, today said to me, um, "How come we don't have financial literacy?" You know, because I'm about to graduate and go into the real world, and I want to make sure that I know what to do with my money, and, and I want to make sure that I don't I'm not in debt because I see all these adults who are suffering financially, and I don't want to be in that position. And you know, you know the old biblical saying from the babies from the mouth of babes. It was one of those moments where I was just like, "Oh my goodness, I wish I had been here earlier." This is my second year as principal of the school, so I wish that I had been here four years ago or maybe five years ago before the, uh, before the student got got to our school, so that this would have been put in place. Uh, financial literacy is something that I'm putting in place um, for next year because it takes literally a year or so to to come for me to like kind of make sure I have the right people in place to offer and write program to offer such, such um, courses. But um, I definitely uh, want to honor this young lady and, and, uh, and I want to make this video and, and kind of like start, start, my, start the ball rolling, at least in my head, on what this could look like for my students. So this, this uh, conversation or this um, talk that I'm about to give is going to be really uncomfortable because I'm going to ask you to really step into your discomfort zone and, and, um, and be willing to say to yourself, you know what? I'm messing up or, or be able to say, you know, and not make any excuses and say, yes, I'm not doing that. I need to start doing that, you know, and be uncomfortable in it, you know, because I'll tell you right, right now, I didn't get my financial, my, my financial house in order until I was in my late thirties. I was already an assistant principal making six figure salary. And I still didn't understand how to really truly have a grasp of my finances, which is weird, but you would think educated, with a bachelor's degree, two master's degree, and an Ivy League degree, that this is something that should be an easy concept concept for me. But one thing I, I've learned about finances is this: money is something that is that starts from childhood. These are money is something understanding of money and appreciation of money is starts from childhood. Understanding how it works starts from childhood because what happens is this: your parents don't have to talk to you about it. But we all pick up from our parents, their behaviors, their characters, and their thought process around money. We do. If your parents were dodging, dodging um, bill collectors and sh- were showing anxiety and were like, turn the lights off and turn the heat down because money doesn't grow on trees, those words eventually become your words. Those words eventually become, you know, um, um, part of your, your entire monologue on how you see money. You know, um, like I remember... Um, uh, my father used to my father used to say cash is king, credit is bad. So what what happened when I when I got older, you know I I try to I try to get as much cash as possible, and and I try to avoid credit. And even when I did have credit, what did I do with credit? I played with it and destroyed it because I didn't respect it because I was taught to respect cash and not credit, you know. And because of his fears, became my dysfunction. So this is one thing I want to do today is in, in what I'm going to share with you, these, these um, three lessons, really ask yourself, how are you handling your finances around these three very, very basic lessons? So let's start. Um, so the book, um, The Richest Man in Babylon, was written in 1926. It's funny because when I first p- picked up this book, 
um, first of all, the first time I saw this book, it was actually an audio book on YouTube. And this was years ago. So I was listening to it and I was like, man, is this like a, a, a lost book from the Bible? <laughs> like the way, the way it was written and the way it's spoken is, is, is um, in alignment with what you would find, biblical, that kind of biblical language. But it's actually a work of, of fiction. And the person who wrote this book is, um, his name is George S. Um, Clayson. And um, he was a soldier and businessman and, and a writer. And he decided to kind of pen through story basic sound financial principles that, that are actually biblical as well. I mean, not, not just biblical. They're just, these are old world concepts that could be found in all faiths and all cultures. He decided to put in, 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 a, in, a, in a story form that would speak to people during his time frame, which was about 100 years ago. So I can imagine the most popular book back then to this day is the Bible. So he chose to kind of write in that language. And, um, and what he wrote, which is a financial classic, literally 1926. This is 2000, it's about to be 2021. So we're talking about this book is uh, 21, 26. We're talking about 95 years old, okay? And it's a bestseller and it still sells to this day. I have two copies in my office. Um, so off the bat, the book starts off with a gentleman named um, Ben Seer. Ben Seer, yeah, Ben Seer. And um, he's a chariot maker. He is supposed to be fixing, building, he's supposed to be finishing a, a chariot, but he, he just can't get into it. Have you ever been at work and you're supposed to be working, but your brain is just like over the place and you're stressing, you know, maybe you're thinking about your bills, you know, it's the end of the month, or maybe you're like, man, it's, um, my, I get paid on, on Friday, it's Tuesday, and I don't, have, I don't even have enough money to get me to, to Thursday, you know? So he was having one of those days, you know? So because he was having one of those days, he just couldn't focus. So he's sitting there just, rather than fixing the chariot that he's finishing the chariot he's building, he's just sitting there and he's huffing and puffing. He's just like going through it. So as he's sitting there, one of his best friends, um, Kabi, is walking by. And Kabi's a music, he's a musician. So he's walking down. I think he has, I think it's a, uh, not a flute, a lute? I think it was a lute. I forget what it's called in the book. But he's walking with his musical instrument. For, for the sake of, of your imagination, imagine he's walking with his, with his trumpet. You know, maybe, maybe you know, Kobe and Ben Sear are not in Babylon, they're in Harlem, okay? So, and maybe Ben Sear is a, is a car mechanic and he's in his shop and Kobe is walking by, he has, has, a tr he has his trumpet. But Kobe walks by and sees Ben Sear, says, hey, Ben Sear, what's going on, man? Like, what, what's good? Are you all right? You're sitting here, like, chilling. Like, damn, life must be good right now because you're not working, you're just sitting here chilling. So, man... Money must be good because usually I see, when I see you, you, you're hard at work. As a matter of fact, <laughs> can I borrow $20? So Kabi says, tells him, like, literally, you know, life must be good. So can I get two shekels? And Ben Sear is like, man, no, life is not good. I'm stressing right now. As a matter of fact, I don't, have, I don't, even, have, to, I don't even have a shekel for myself to give you two shekels. So, so Kabi is like, Ben Seer, like, what's, what's going on? He's like, man, I'm just, I, I just don't know how, how to get, get out of this place, this financial space I'm in, you know? And to make things worse, let's not have a dream. I had a dream that I had so much money that I could do whatever I wanted to do with all the money that I had. You know, it was beautiful. I had cash here, bank accounts there, a car, a house. Like, I was just wealthy beyond belief. I was so happy. Then I woke up and I realized it was just a dream. How many of you guys have ever been in that position where you, 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 go, you go into, maybe it's, it's an actual dream, you're sleeping, you're having those, those sweet dreams, or maybe it's just you're fantasizing of how things could be to the point that you could feel it, you could smell it, you could taste it. But then you realize the reality is so far from that dream. That's where Ben Sear was. And Kabi sits down next to him and says, man, you know what? Mind you, Kobe was just asking for twenty. He was just asking for two shekels, you know, asking for twenty bucks. So he's probably not in a good place himself. And he's sitting there with Ben Sear, and he's like, "Oh, why, why, why is this happening to us? You know, we're we're both young, you know, intelligent men, well educated. You know, maybe they went to college. You know, maybe they have master's degrees. Maybe they're certified technicians, whatever. And they make. And he's like, but." With all that we have, we can't keep money in our hands. We can't maintain a lifestyle that is respectable for men of our stature. 
And him and Benson go back and forth, and they're like, you know what? Man, they got to be a solution to this. So Kabi says to Benson, you know what? I saw Akkard earlier. You know, and Akkard is one of their, is one of their friends. And I'm probably saying it wrong. Uh, a card or R card, you know, he said one of their friends. And it's like, and you know what the funny thing about that man? He's, he always has money. Like money does not leave his hands. He has so much money that he, he's very helpful to people. He helps the poor and he, and he, he keeps building businesses and he's hiring people. Like he's so successful. What's the difference between him and us? What is it that he's doing that he knows that we don't know? He's a friend of ours. We went to school together. You know, you know what we should do? We should go to him right now and ask him, like, dude, what's up? What, what are you doing that we're not doing? So they went over there. And this is where I want to stop the story because the story goes into much detail and it's, it's, well, it's beautifully written. But I want to pull three concepts from what, he, what they learned from, from, um, from Eckhart. And, it's, and these three concepts is not even the tip of the sword, but it's the... Is, is the is the handle is the base of it, you know the foundation of of what he teaches them. So he shares Eckhart shares three three um three uh three lessons, you know actually no he shares actually seven principles, but I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, three lessons which are foundational lessons that I believe that I don't care how old you are, I don't care what your race is, I don't care what your gender is, I don't care what your if you're if you are in high school if you're in elementary school. If you can read and you can understand the words that are coming out of my mouth, these principles can be applied right now. Okay, and before I even go into the three principles, I want to say something. Because so I was talking to my wife about this, and she said, you know, she was giving me some advice of, about what what I what spin I can take with this. And she said, it's the holiday seasons, season, and right now people are spending a lot of money. People are spending money that they don't have. Because the reality is this, the way we've been groomed in this society is this. When we are suffering, we spend. When we're suffering, we eat. When we're suffering, we overindulge. We do anything to make us feel tempor to, to, to temporarily ease our pain. And 2020 has been all pain. And this holidays, it's funny because, and I'll, and I'll say this, and, um, you know, when people have lost their jobs and the way the economy is going, I remember I had to, I had to go to Best Buy to get a piece of, um, a, a, piece of a device for my setup here. And when I walked in there, it was, it was like the, that, I think it was like that Saturday after Black Friday, um, Thanksgiving. First of all, it was jam-packed. People were buying TVs, moving TVs, and they were just going all out, you know. And I was just sitting there thinking, like, I thought we were in an economic, like, state of emergency. But what happened is this, a lot of us, we get in, we, 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 our pain, our pain is often so much that we try to find a way to numb ourselves. And often one of the ways we do it is by spending. We, we get a new gadget or we do a new, we, we get something new to, to ease our pain and often to mask what's going on with us, with others, you know? So, um, so I know for a fact right now, a lot of you who are going to be watching this video or listen to this video right now, might, a lot of you are in a situation where you're like, man, I should probably shouldn't have to spend that money. Now I have all these credit card bills. How am I going to get out of this? You know, this will never end. So these three, these three principles, please listen carefully and please find a way to, as soon as this, 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 uh, this, uh, this video is over with, Pull out your notebook, pull out your phone, and start writing what you, your next steps and how you're going to apply this um, to your situation. So um, I have my notes here because, you know, I am, I am a teacher, so my, my, I have a tendency to keep notes, so I just want to make sure I cover everything. So the three lessons I'm going to be touching upon from this book, and mind you, these are just three lessons, and they're not, it doesn't comprise all seven principles. The, the book goes into much detail. So the, um, the first lesson is this, live below your means. Okay, live below your means. And so, okay, so before I, I, I'm not even going to any detail yet. I'm just going to list all three. So live below your means is number one. Number two is learn how to be lucky. I know that was a crazy one. Learn how to be lucky. Okay, yes, you you will see. Being lucky is not a, a circumstance of chance. Okay, 
Chance is chance. Luck is not chance, okay? So learn how to be lucky. Number two, never take on, take on debt. And that's a hard one. Because if you have a credit card, it may, as soon as you swipe it, you're taking on debt. You know, if you're going to college these days, you're taking on debt. You're getting a car, more, more than likely you're taking on debt. You're buying a house, you're taking on debt. So, we, so I'm going to kind of like explain that in a little more detail, what that means. So let's jump into the first one. So the first one um, is uh, um, living below your means. So the first question I have for you is this. How, how or what makes rich people rich? Okay. Some of the things you're gonna, people are going to say is that oh, oh, they're born into it, or they're mad talented, or they're, 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 they're lucky. They're lucky. That's, how, that's why people, some people are just so lucky. Okay. Some people are so talented. And then they will say, they're lucky. They're so talented, that's why they're lucky. You know, or they're lucky that they're so talented. Um, and, but let, let's pin a picture of rich people. A um, couple of, I mean, of course, we have those we, that we're like, you know, they're born into it. Okay, if, you, if, you're fa- your, if your father is a Saudi prince, or your mother is a Saudi princess, and you have oil wells, that's, hey, that's, that's the next level that I can't even tell you how to get to there, but they, they, you're born into that. But that's less than 1% of 1% of the population. That's a very tiny percentage. I'm talking to people who are rich because they started from the bottom, now they're there. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. So, some concepts. Some people will say is that um, they, they work so hard, they put the hours nonstop, nonstop. They just work, 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 stack, stack their money, put it, save those coins in, in their beds, right? Some people will say that... Um, that um, that some people are just um, I mean they, they play the lottery and they they win the lottery you know and they decide to become rich, you know. But the thing about it is becoming rich. There's there, there are principles to it, and the number one thing that people who are building wealth do off the bat is that they 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 live slightly below their means, and slightly. Is whatever you want it, to, whatever you need it to be for your circumstance. But they definitely live below the below their means. What does that mean? If you're making a thousand dollars a week, okay. Let's say let me let me make it more round. You're making a thousand dollars a month, okay. And depending on where you live, your rent is two hundred dollars a month, okay. You have eight hundred dollars left, okay. You have a car note, insurance. Um, I don't know. Um. So you have some, some loans, personal loans, you know, you, you bought some jewelry or whatever the case may be. And all of a sudden, now guess what? That, that $800 now is cut, another $400 is off. You have $400 left. You got to buy groceries and pay your utilities and everything else. Now, now you only have $100 left. You know, and you got to pay gas, right? Transportation. The next thing you know, the $4,000 is spent. So what happens is now you got to wait for the next pay cycle to do it all over again every month, all over again every month. Living below you means is asking yourself, what is in that space that you do not need? Did you really have to upgrade that, your, your 60-inch TV to a 75-inch? Like 60 to 75-inch because it was on sale and it's a great bargain. And there's nothing wrong with a 60-inch TV. Nothing wrong at all. 75-inch is just 50 inches bigger. But... When you buy it, you put it, in, and most time when you buy it, you realize it was it's even too big, but you really bought it. Okay. Finding ways to minimize your spending, you know, saying that you know what, I'm going to make sure that I, I have a grocery list when I go grocery shopping, rather than just, rather than just walking to the store and just buying whatever off the shelves. These and think about it, these are these are basic concepts that often we all know we fell out because we get so caught up in the moment of our emotions and we buy and buy and buy. Sometimes we have subscriptions for a million different things that we don't even use. And I've, listen, I've, listen, I've had to catch myself a couple of times where I find myself, you know, um, buying, like doing stuff. I'm like, why did I do that for? You know, or, or forgetting that I, uh, that I have subscription for something that I don't even use, you know, like those things, we all do it because we live in a world where that is the, the way the world is set up. For us to spend, 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 you have to sit down and ask yourself, what am I spending my money on and what can I cut back? Because if you live below your means, that means you have a little bit more money left every month, every week. Now, what you do with that money, 
can define the level of wealth you can build. But if you have nothing left, then guess what? I heard, I heard this, I heard this, 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 uh, this concept that I thought was, was, was very powerful. If you're working and you have nothing left at the end of the month, you are a slave to everybody who takes money out of your pocket. Because that means you're working to make sure that they get money. Your landlord, you're working to make sure that they get money. Your car note, you're working, you're working to make sure that that bank gets money. So you're working your blood, sweat, and tears to make sure that you're putting money in their hands. And at the end of the month, you have nothing in your hands. I mean, how else can you label that other than in slavery or indentured servitude? And any way it goes, you are, they're your master because everything that you earn goes back to them, right? You have to have something that comes back to you so you can pay your master, yourself. You have to master yourself. Even if it's just a fraction of your income, that amount of money becomes yours, you know? And, um, and I just want to put this up here real quick. You're very right. It's a vicious cycle. And but the reality, the vicious cycle could be broken. A lot of times we think to ourselves when it comes to um, living below means that if this is a cycle and we're trying to, we, what we're trying to do is we're, we're trying to break the whole entire thing. But then how do you break a cycle, a circle? But the cycle is a circle. How do you break it? It's very simple. Cut a little bit. That little bit you cut is what, what breaks the cycle. Taking a little bit out of it. So that's all you're doing is taking a little bit out of, out of, your, out of your, your earnings and setting it to the side. Okay? That is something we need to start doing. And what is this called? It's called saving. That's that old school concept, saving. And I know that, trust me, if you go online, you're going to find a lot, of people, a lot of people who are financial gurus who are saying, saving, no, you don't want to save. You want to, yeah, you know, the foundation of building wealth off the bat is saving because if you don't have, you know, a capital to start off with your, with your building your wealth, then guess what? You're going to be in that cycle and you're going to continue to be a slave. So, um, um, so off the bat, people, some people might say, like, how much should I be saving? How much, how much should, I be, should, I, should I set aside? I'm going to go biblical on you. And this is not just biblical. This also... It's biblical, it's also um, ancient because you find th this number in a lot of faiths and religions and cultures that 10%, okay, that tithing, that 10th percent. And I, what I'm saying to you is this, I, regardless of what your religious belief is and how you, how you want to donate to your, your, to your faith, if you, you need to set aside a, your own personal tithing to yourself. 10% of whatever you earn, 10%. Should go into your pocket. That means if you have a if you have ten dollars, one dollar is yours. If you have a hundred dollars, ten dollars is yours. If you have a thousand dollars, a hundred dollars should be yours. But what is yours? You do not spend. That's the money that you set to the side. If you, whether you put it into a savings account, it doesn't matter if it's yielding 0.001 percent. Hey, it's making it's yielding you something. Or you put that money in, into a money market account, or you put it into some kind of secured securities. But that money. It's set to the side, you do not touch. 10% minimum. Minimum. Some of you are going to say, but you don't understand. Where, where do I find 10%? Like, I am maxed out. Okay. Do you buy coffee every day? Then guess what? Make your own coffee. The $2 coffee you, you spend at a gas station, you know, if you buy, if you buy a jar of, of, of Folgers, Crystal, or whatever, and make your own coffee, your coffee is probably going to cost you 25 cents a day compared to the $2 you're spending. That means you have $1.75 every day multiplied by five days a week or how many days a week did you go and buy coffee, right? You know, when you go to the store and they're saying, oh, that organic section, how you know it's organic? Because they told you it's called organic? Okay, the concept of organic is not what you think it is. If you, if you, companies say it's organic, it's not necessarily organic. It just might mean... They did one little thing that's different from this thing, but at the end of the day, it's still the same fruit. Rather than paying $2 a pound for apples, pay the 75 cents for apples on this side. You have to find ways to get more money set to the side for your own personal wealth, okay? So again, living be below your means, okay? 10% should be the minimum you should start off with, you know? And one thing I want to say real quick, because I also want to talk to, um, to kids and students and young people. Um, this applies to you as well. This is Christmas time. If you get Christmas money, 10%. 
if, 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 if Paw Paw or TT gives you gives you ten dollars, a dollar should be set to the side. Get a piggy bank, you know, one of those that you got to break it and put that dollar in there. You know, if somebody gives you change, you know, here, here's some change, and you're, and you're five years old. Okay, you get fifty cents. Put a, put a nickel in, in that thing. If you could put if you could put all of it in there, then put all of it in there. But at least put ten percent. This is something that parents you gotta get your kids doing early on. Sometimes you might have to force them and say, "Hey, I'm gonna take ten percent of that and put it aside for you." You know, don't spend it though. Don't take their money and spend it and be like, "Yo, well, you know what happened was." Don't do that. Let that money sit in a place where they can see it. So because what's gonna happen is they realize that five cents compounded that dollar you add in there, that five dollars you add in there. Over the course of the year, a kid who had, you know, zero dollars at the end of the year now has five hundred dollars. Do you think they might fall in love with the idea of saving money? But then often they're seeing, whoa, if I save this, guess what happens now? I'm gonna have more money in the long run. You know? And that's the other thing too, I wish my parents had done. I wish they had sat with me and spoken, talked to me about money. But I mean they didn't have they didn't have that that foundation, you know. But I wish that, that I had been given that to be like, this is what money can do for you. This is how money money works. You know, that wasn't done for me. So as, as a result, you know, the whole notion of if I put money to the side, I can have so much more at, at, on the back end was something that was so foreign to me. So it's very, very important that um, parents, you do this for, for younger ones. If you're, if you're a teenager, you got to build that discipline right now. Okay. Save your money. Okay, don't get caught up in like, oh, I got to get that Xbox. I got to get this. For what? Because guess what? After year, this year, next year, is gonna, dude, there's going to be a new one, right? There's going to be another one. And you're going to keep, you're a slave to the Xbox. You're a slave to those sneakers. Okay? Listen, and trust me, look, what, over here? What is it, over here? Sneakers. I'm, a, I'm the sneaker principal. But my wife will attest to it. Every sneaker, but we sit down on, on StockX and go and we look at the values. I buy, sometimes I buy sneakers just because I'm going to hold them till next summer to resell, okay? Because I'm making my money work for, for me. I have so many sneakers that I know, I, I, like in my brain I tell myself, I'm gonna wear these, I can't wait to wear these, and I know I'm not gonna wear them. Because if I bought them for $150 and somebody's gonna give me $300, huh, sneakers on my feet, $100, or, or, or $150 profit in my bank account. Yeah, you know what, I, I rock some Vans. I rock some Vans, you can have them Jades, give me my $300. That's the way I think. And that's the way we need to train our kids. If we show them these things, guess what? We are naturally in our core entrepreneurs. We want to make money. But at some point in time, we were lied to that it was hard or it was, it was not something that we can do. So please, talk to, talk, talk to your kids about this and start to encourage your, your, your older kids. And if you're listening to this and you're a teenager, literally, I'm going to say one more time. Spend less than you earn. And, and earning could just be even your gifts. If somebody gives you money or whatever the case is, put at least 10% to the side. If you put all of it to the side, then do that. But at least 10%, okay? So now, lesson number two, um, hard work. Not hard work, I'm sorry, luck. <laughs> say, in learn, learn how, how to make luck. Um, actually, I'm, uh, first of all, let me say it the right way. It says, learn how to be lucky. So now, the whole notion of learning how to be lucky is it's it's interesting because luck is the product of two or three simple concepts. When you put the work in, you're working hard and you're developing skill, okay, and you're, and you're preparing and you're practicing that skill. This is what happens now. Luck can find you. What does that mean? Okay, I'm going to use a, a, a concept that makes that makes sense. Those of you have heard the story about Michael Jordan that in middle school he got cut from his basketball team, okay? Or Kobe Bryant tells a story about when he was 11 years old. I think it was his first first game that he played in. He scored zero points. Can you imagine Kobe Bryant scoring zero points? Kobe Bryant scoring zero points? And his father was there. His father is, is also an NBA, an NBA legend. You know, he's his, his father played in, in the NBA. So you're sitting, you're on a court your first game, your father who plays in the NBA is sitting there is in, the, in, in the stands or on, on the side, on, on, on court side, you know, and you want to impress your father. And at the end of the game, you scored zero points. Zero points. He says that at that moment in time, he, he, he felt broke, he cried, and he, and he didn't want to play no more. And his father said, listen, 
whether you, you score a thousand points or or you score zero points, I will always love you. And he said his father his father gave him permission in that moment in time to be as horrible as he, as he needs to be to be as great as he would be. Okay, so he practiced, he played, he got better and got better and got better and got better. He didn't go from the high school to the NBA because he was lucky. But there had been a lot of guys who'd gone to, to the to, who were just as good as he was, you know. But it's this: his preparation, his devotion to his to what he was doing, his hard work, made him lucky. Because guess what happens now? Where he stood next to other people who were as qualified he as he was, he can show, he can prove his value. How does that apply to your money? Um, the way it applies to your money is this. As you're working hard to save that money, put that money to the side, and you're building your discipline, and that one dollar becomes ten dollars, becomes a hundred dollars, becomes ten thousand dollars, you know, it can happen. It, get, it becomes ten thousand dollars. Now, you're able to now maybe start a business, or you're able to now make a sizable investment in something because you've done your homework, you've done your research, and like unlike a lot of people who say, "Man, only if I, if I only had." $10,000, but in your case, you have $10,000. You've done your homework. You've been diligent. And now you can take that money and put it into something and make your money work for you. You know what people are going to call you? They're going to call you lucky. Oh, he lucky. Oh, she lucky. Oh, she she always got the, she, she always lucky, you know? But the reality, they don't see the fact that the work you put in, the sacrifices, the, what, you, where you cut, what, what, what you cut out just to make sure that you're able to um to to actually have the money to invest, okay? That is luck right there. Luck is the, is the byproduct of devotion, preparation, and being steadfast. Because when you put that money to the side, then guess what? People are gonna call you lucky because now you have the resources to now go out there and do what you wanna do, okay? Whether it's buy a house or whatever that investment is, okay? But first, number one, live below your means, which means setting aside is ten percent of your income or whatever you earn, your gifts, presents. It doesn't matter how old you are. And then, what's going to happen is that as that pot grows, you know, because it's work. Trust me. Sitting. Down, how many of you guys have ever done this? You're saving money, and it seems like as you're saving money, every other moment, every other second, something pops up. A good deal pops up over here. You know, this opportunity comes up over here. All of a sudden, people are calling like, yo, we're going to Mexico on, on, for spring break. You want to come? And you're like, damn, I've been, I've not been on vacation for like mad long. Man, I do have this $5,000 in the bank. You know, I could take $1,000 out, out of it and go on this trip. But remember, that $1,000 now makes you, a, makes you a slave to that hotel, to that beach, to that, to that city, because that money could have been making you more money, but now you just gave it away. You know, and you got to think like that. You know, but it's that's hard work. But that but that takes a lot of discipline to do that. So again, the hard work that you put in to, into anything, okay, put the money to the side to 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 your to your business to whatever it is that you're doing, is what sets you up to be lucky to now find other opportunities. Okay, so always remember that luck by itself is is, is nonsense. Okay, what we call luck and we understand as luck is really chance. You know. You know, if I get the lucky sevens, no. If I get the chance sevens, by chance I get these sevens, uh, or by chance I hit this lottery ticket, the lottery, then yeah. But it's not luck. Luck is a pro. Is, I'm going to say it again. It's a byproduct of your preparation and your devotion and the hard work you put in to achieving your goals. That is what luck is. So again, that um second principle is. And I just want to make sure I word it correctly. Learn how to be lucky. Okay, and the way you learn it is by staying the course of living below your means and putting that money to the side, you know, and then eventually you get into the place where you can get, take that money and make it work for you and start to really build wealth. And then number three, number three, number three, number three, and this is the hardest one of them all. What we're going to talk about right now is this, debt. We all have it. I'm going to tell you right now, I have it. You know, I know I, I have it. I have student loan debt and it's, 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 I, listen, I, I, these days, I'm voting. I vote according to my student my student loans because I need this government to do something about these student loans. You know, 
Um, but um, the thing about debt is this. Number three is this. Never take on debt. I know that's a hard concept to, 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 to do, only because we live in a world where most of the time, depending unless you unless you are the son of that that uh, that oil sheik, you know, or or you know, or you were born into generational wealth, if you're buying a car, most of the time you're gonna have to finance it. If you're buying a house, most of the time you're gonna have to finance it. You know, um, but the thing is this: sometimes we take on unnecessary debt. You know, you see that bracelet and you're like, oh my god, that's a beautiful diamond bracelet. I really want it, so I'm gonna put the. Uh, the six thousand dollar expense on my credit card. Now you've taken on debt that's unnecessary because you got to pay back that six thousand dollars. So now you're a slave to that bracelet until it's paid off, and that six thousand dollars that you could have probably had set away for your for your ambitions and for your dreams, but you don't. But it's not there now because it's now, you know, belongs to somebody else. So we need to really be in a space where we understand that debt is as a choice that we make. Um, it's, it says that the average American has um, $150,000. It's $150,000 in debt, the average American. So you can imagine the, the more you're middle class, the more money you're making, more likely the more debt you have. So now, how can you apply this? So I'm, I'm going I'm to share something personal. And um, so uh, up until this summer, I, I, uh, I had a, uh, a Mercedes, uh, it was the GL550, uh, okay? And it's a beautiful car, you know, definitely a, a neck breaker. I know, you know, it was all white, you know, beautiful leather and everything else. And it was a nice big truck. And I got that car and I was thinking to myself, this is a beautiful car and it's big for the family and it's safe and all these different things. And of course, I was paying Jewel L GL550 money for, for this car, you know. And when it came to repairs, I was paying GL550, Mercedes-Benz GL550 money for the repairs. My oil changes were, in some cases, some people's car notes, you know? Because in my mind, I justified it as, you know, but it's, it's, a, it's a safe, high-quality car. But the thing is this. For me to make that decision to get that car, I had an irrational self-talk that made me justify getting a car that really didn't make any sense. What is a car but metal parts and four wheels? And this summer, I had to check my ego and say, I told my wife, you know what? I think it's best that we, we change this car and get something that's more practical. And I'll tell you this, all the way in my search for a car that could fit our needs, I was thinking to myself, what are people going to think? Because now they're going to see that I'm not driving that, that Mercedes anymore. What are they going to think? But the reality is, it was so irrational because what does the, uh, I had a friend of mine who used to say, what does the cost of tea in China have to do with me? What does what you're thinking have to do with me? You know, um, the great Dr. Miles Monroe used to say in one of his sermons, I don't care what you think about me. Because what you think about me has nothing to, and it has no impact on my success. So now, you know, we have a, um, a, a, uh, a, a 2019 Honda Passport, okay? My payments are like pff, in, inconsequential compared to the Mercedes because I had to ask myself, what makes the most sense? What's going to create more cash flow in, 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 my, in my family's economy? And it was getting this car that is just as safe, just as reliable, probably even more reliable because it's, it's, it's actually newer. And, and I got myself out of that, that bondage. I, I mean, I'm still in bondage, but I'm still paying that. But I had to make sure that I put myself in a better position than I was before. And that's the thing. When we take on debt, we have to make sure that this debt is necessary and it makes sense. And it cannot be based on emotions. If you go based on emotions, then we will always fail. Okay? We have to be very practical. We have to be rational. So um, here are my notes I have. It says one of the first steps to build wealth is quitting the irrational self-talk that makes you justify purchases that you cannot afford. Okay, so that's something that's very, very important. Remember that, okay? Do not allow irrational um, self-talk to make you do things that's financially not practical for yourself or your family. Um, and, and now, how, and this applies to a lot of things. You know, sometimes we go for that apartment because it's, it's in a new high-rise and while we can live down the block, in, in the older building that's just as warm and just as nice. It's just not, it just it doesn't have a doorman. 
I'm talking about like New York City. So you're paying five thousand here for for a two bedroom when you could be down the block and pay three thousand for a two bedroom. But you want, but you want everybody to know that uh, yes, I live at uh, Fifty Park Avenue. Yes, with the doorman, you know, Pedro. For what? You know, like for what? So you could, so you could, so you could see more more importance than other people. But guess what though? The person who's down the block with that cheaper rent is about probably building wealth faster than you are. You know? So think about that. So now, how does it apply to our to our to to young people? Because I also want to have a bent on that. Is this. Um, the biggest source of our debt when we're young, especially coming out of high school, is college. You know, and I'm gonna tell you, and I'm not here to dissuade anybody from, from pursuing your dreams in college, but I definitely want to give practical visioning, something for you to think about. Coming out of um, high school for me, I wish, beyond having financial literacy, I wish I had um, access to generational wisdom when it came to college. You know, uh, my father went to college. He went to college in, in another country and very different from America. You know, when he went to college, everything was paid for, you know, by the, by the government there. It was not like here where where literally education could become your biggest source of debt. So as I was applying, you know, I fell prey to the to the uh, to the chair and the glory of oh you're applying to college what school you going to, what school are you applying to? I went to school in Southern California, as you can imagine. You know, Southern California, we have some some amazing colleges just in the state of California. You could go to UCLA, be a Bruin, you could go to USC, be a Trojan. You can go to uh, you can go further upstate and go to Stanford. You can go Pepperdine and there's all these amazing schools. I went on college trips and I was like, oh my God, these schools are amazing. They're so different from the hood that, I, that I'm growing up in. So as I, was, as I was applying, I applied to amazing schools. I applied to Morehouse, I applied to Howard, I applied to, I applied to Yale, I applied to, to um, NYU because I had the grades, you know, and I had the foundational academics to, to, to get into these schools. And at the end of the day, I, I decided to go to the University of Rochester. They flew me out, flew, flew me out to the school. I fell in love with the school. It was amazing. It was beautiful. The old, like, you know, the northeast brick buildings, red brick buildings with the IVs, and the, and the, you know, and the, the vast lawns. And it was just beautiful, you know. Like, you know, then the, the, the snowy landscape in the winter. I fell in love with the catalog and on all that. But that $40,000 a year um, price tag had to be paid. Now, what I wish that I knew then, that I, then I'm sure what I wish that I, that, that I could have known then that I know now is this. If I could do it over again, I would have gone to a community college. Back then, when I was in, when I was in, uh, in high school, uh, tuition for any community college in the state of California was $13 per credit, thirteen dollars per credit, and the funny thing, no one told me that. How did I know? I, the summer after my freshman, after my freshman year, um, I came home, and and my father was like, you know, you either going to get a job or do something. You you, you can't sit at home all summer doing nothing. So I was like, okay, I'm going to go take a cl- take a class at um the, the community college. And I'm sitting there, and, he, and he's there with me. He, actually, he's there for me. He's like, I'm going to pay for the class. We're there, and it was $13 of credit. I was like, $13 for what? And I'm thinking to myself, oh, this must be, this must be fake school because there's no way in the world that college is $13 of credit. Because where I was going to, tuition was at um, was a, I was roughly about $38,000 a year, then plus room and board. Here, community college in California at the time was $13 of credit. How much would it have cost me to do my first two years in a community college in California. I don't think that's over a thousand dollars for an, for literally for a uh, an associate's degree, which then I could have uh, probably applied and transferred on a full on a full ride as long as I had my straight A's and did what I needed to do, and then move on to maybe UCLA or or Cal or, um, or University of, uh, I'm sorry University of California Berkeley or maybe even Stanford. And probably gone there on a full ride because I've already proven my ability to do college level work. Because I'll tell you this right now, that course that I took in the summer, I took a psych one on one class. It kicked my butt, and I was like, you know, this is college. They they're giving homework, and we're doing work here. The same work we're doing at University of Rochester, which is at the point in time was one of the top fifty schools in the country. And I was like, University of Rochester, where I'm an undergrad at, and this summer course I'm taking at it was at Southwest, it was at Southwest Los Angeles Community College. Same caliber of teaching, same caliber of work. 
and now I realize, you know, uh, and I'm fortunate to be in a position that I am to, to make a good income, but I probably wouldn't have had, had had to take on the debt that I took on from college if I had gone to community college or, or if I had been guided towards looking at cost over, you know, um, over, you know, the whole concept of the dream, what kind of college you want to go to, what kind of environment, do you want a big school or a small school? Do you want a school that is farther away or closer away? No one ever said, do you want to, do you want to go to an expensive school or an affordable school? That was never part of the conversation, not once. We got caught up in the glory of it, the glory of it all to be able to say, I got into the school. But the reality is, what should have been said is, I now owe this school. You know, so that's the one of the things I would say, you know, um, those of you who are in high school, seniors, whatever the case is, what do you think about that? Make that part of, part of your, your, your criteria, the cost of that school. What programs are they offering? You know, what am I going to major in? You know, what is the earning potential of what I'm majoring in? What is, what, what, what is, what, what is the potential path I want to go down? You know, is it worth it going to NYU and spending, you know, walking away with, maybe $150,000, $200,000 in debt and not have a job. Because right now, people don't have people are losing their jobs and they're not working. Or is it better for me to, do, to find another path that puts me in a, in, a, in, a, in a trajectory to really earn an income that you know allows me to live a life where I can live below my means, save money, and then not be a slave to the paycheck and paying everybody else other than myself. So, so that lesson number three, taking on debt, for me, I takes on takes on a special meaning, especially when I think about education, because I know right now I could I could have done what I'm doing right now and not even come close to the loans I had to take out for all my all my education. But the things were programmed that way. We're programmed that way. That's what society wants us to do, and um, the, the only way we break out of it is that we start to live by certain principles that puts us in a position to be financially um, responsible and and really build towards wealth. So um. Again, I, I just want to quickly review those three, those three lessons, uh, what we talked about this evening. Again, we we're talking about the, um, the book, The Richest Man in Babylon, um, by um, George Clayson, who, um, told, who took the old school biblical narrative to write a story about, about two men who were trying to seek how to build wealth from a friend of theirs who was successful and was willing to teach them concepts, old school concepts that they, they could apply. The book has, seven, I think it has about seven principles, but I share with you, three themes, three themes from the book that you can start right now, start thinking about as far as, as, as you're moving forward. And I, uh, and uh, those three themes again are living below your means, number two, learning how to be lucky, and number three, um, never never taking on debt, you know. And, and I'm, gonna, I'm going to qualify that by saying never taking on unnecessary debt and making sure the debt you take on is necessary, you know. So um, that's pretty much it. Um. I know there's some people out here who are watching, who are listening. And um, before I jump off, are there any questions, any thoughts, any comments? Because I hope this is helpful to um, those of you out there. And again, the the uh, Injoku ch this this is the Injoku School. Um, this is the channel, and part of this channel is is a couple of spaces where I um I talk about education. I talk about um I talk about uh, uh I have a podcast also where I've been guests on here. Sometimes it's just me. Just really, really looking at our community and how we can improve ourselves. And um, another big piece of it is looking at um, financial literacy. This is something that um, this we need in schools, we need in our community. And it's a lot of people who are, who are in this space. And I'm, I'm just lending my voice in this space as an educator, as a pure educator, to um, really try to convince people in your communities, talk to your principals, talk to your school districts, to mandate financial education. You know, because financial literacy matters, you know. It does matter because a lot of us are going into the world and we're struggling unnecessarily because we were never taught. How are you going to teach me geometry and not teach me, you know, interest rates? Think about that. How are you going to teach me Shakespeare and not teach me FICO? How are you going to have, have me apply to college and not sit down and really explain to me the long-term um, um, pros and cons of what school I go to or what majors I major in and the economic disadvantage I might find myself in if I make the wrong choices or not make the right, or not choose the right path to, to minimize, you know, finding myself in incredible debt. So, um, 
So this, so this is the goal here. Um, thank you so much um, for those of you who are here. Thank you, Brenda, for, for co-signing. Thank you, uh, Chinway, for co-signing as well. Um, and again, this is, uh, if there's no questions, thank you so much for your time. How much, how much time have I been going for? Whoa, I've been going for an hour. This is the longest I've ever gone for for these, for these um, spaces. But again, this was inspired by one of my students today doing an assembly who asked the question. She asked it blatantly. She said, why aren't we getting financial literacy? And unfortunately, we are implementing it this year, but she's a senior, so she won't be able to get it because she has to finish her credits to graduate. But this is something that I'm working on in my school to make sure moving forward that we have a space, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th grade, to really make sure students, kids are learning these concepts as part of their DNA into, in, into, into, um, their, um, into, into their, their futures. Um, Brenda says, uh, I teach my 14 year old, um, all that information because school does not, yeah, it doesn't teach it. it, it no, schools don't, you know, schools don't. And I, and it's funny because I will tell you one thing. And I learned this recently that, um, John, like, um, John Rockefeller, John D Rock Rockefeller for the, you know, the Rockefeller family, not Rockefeller records with Jay-Z, but the real Rockefellers who were, uh, I think they were industrialists. Some of the richest people who, um, who lived in Dunia time. He was part of a, lo a lobbying of the government to remove financial education from schools. Once upon a time, financial literacy was in schools. It was mandated, but they removed it. And, his, and, and I'm paraphrasing what he said. I don't need thinkers. I need workers. How terrifying is that? Because this is over 100 years ago. So that means we are a legacy of that, of th of that move, of that of that politics I don't need thinkers I need workers so if we can't think and we're, all we're doing is working you're pretty much saying all I need is slaves I, I just need people who are who are tied into this factory system who are going to come in here do their job take their pennies so I can keep the dollars so now that we know that you know we need to be lobbying in our schools to make sure these things are in place and if they're not going to put them in place, then you can watch videos like this and sit your child and say, "Hey, let's talk about this." You can get books like, and I'll put a, I'll put a link, uh, I'll put a link to to, to the book, um, so you, so you can access it. It's super cheap. I like, I have two copies in my office. I've actually given it away. I've had kids be like, "What the, what's that book?" And I'm like, "You know, you could have it." And I bought another copy because I'm hoping that they'll read it. And 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 as a matter of fact, for next year that we're having, um, we're going to have a full uh, a our first full course in financial literacy. Um, I'm going to use this book as the, as the grounding um, uh, text. So then after this book, then we can start going into like digging deeper into, st into stocks and bonds and mutual funds and, and having our students understand what these things are, you know, and be, actually be able to play with it virtually and understand, okay, this is what Nike is. This is what Adidas is. And this is what Microsoft is. We need to understand this. We cannot continue to, as a people, you know, as a black and brown people to be disenfranchised from that space. Because a lot of these spaces, a lot of these companies, okay, and, and, and I don't want to get super political, but Wall Street in New York City, historically, Wall Street, the Wall Street itself has been around going back into the 1700s. And, these, and, it's, and it was right by the docks, right by the water, you know? And these used to sell slaves on that street, you know? And I don't know whether or not it's fiction, but I read there used to be a wall there where they would stand the slaves and sell them. So Wall Street is part of the legacy of making money off of us. And we're sitting here not understanding that system because we want to be angry. Listen, I don't have time to be angry. It's time for me to make sure that my children have the foundation that they need to not make the mistakes that I made and that not only that I'm blessing the future generations. You know, so they can say that grandpa and grandma made sure that we're good. So we cannot build off of that. So um, with that being said, guys, thank you so much. Um, thank you, um, Brenda, for sharing that and, and, and much, much respect to what you're doing with your, with your, with your, uh, with your child. Um, uh, Dominic Washington, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to keep, I'm, thank you so much for the praises because, you know, I'm going to tell you this guy, this guy, this is hard. Like I, I like during the day. I, I feel like I'm I'm Bruce Wayne. I'm Batman. So during the day, I'm I'm Bruce Wayne. I'm I'm official in the suit and I'm 
do I'm leading my school and doing all that thing and then at night time I, I go dark. I have the hoodie on and I'm I'm down here doing another thing in, in, in this digital space. But you know, I gotta find I I, I, I wanna make sure that um that I'm putting out there what's necessary for all of us to 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 be successful. Um and again, thank you so much. And yes, Brenda, I'll make sure to, I'll make sure to put that book on on into the description. Uh, I'm, and after I'm done with this, I'm going to go in there and fill out the description so you you you, you have a link to it. And um, yeah, so thank you again, everyone, for for being for listening. I really appreciate all of you all. And um, and again, this is Uche Njoku, Sneaker Principal. This is the Njoku School sh- um, channel. And um, I'll see you guys soon. And please do me a, a huge huge favor. Um, please subscribe. Please subscribe, share this link, help this out, this the YouTube algorithm um, push out this content so we get as many people here as possible. And again, I will be back here um, with uh, Financial Literacy Matters next Wednesday at 1030 and with a new topic. And, um, and again, I, I go live on Saturdays at 10 o'clock with the podcast as well. So again, thank you so much. And, um, and thank you, Xinwei. My little, that's actually my little sister, my, the baby of our family. So thank you so much. I love you too. And uh, with that being said, thank you guys. Be well, and be safe and um, happy holidays. You know, happy holidays and my, my regards to your family. If, if, if I know this has been, I know I'm still talking, I know this has been a tough year, but um, please take, take this, this time to just be in grace and, and in gratitude because um. Not everybody is fortunate enough to be to even be able to spend this this holidays with their families. So thank you so much. Be well, and I'll talk to you all soon. Okay, peace.